Before beginning the webinar, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. First, Jonathan Dina. He teaches at the um, Social Sciences uh, Program at La Salle College since 27, uh, 2007. He has a master's in English Lit from uh, Dalhousie University and a bachelor's with uh, honorable mention in liberal arts at Concordia University. Pascal Ramos teaches at the specialized education technology uh, the, uh, section at uh, Collège La Salle since 2008. She has a master's degree in education from Starbucks University and a specialization in psychology. Uh, passion and interest uh, from Jonathan and Pascal for pedagogy and using technology in class brought them to win the Excellence Prize uh, in 2018, the Excellence Prize for Teaching at La Salle College. Bravo. They also got a grant for research in 2017 to uh, be able to test these tools in class and uh, a, an award in 2018 for uh, virtual reality in the classroom setting. In 2020, they received a grant, a uh, research grant from the Minister of Higher Education in Quebec to conduct research on applying the use of video games in the classroom. They were published in June 2022. So I wish you a great webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Now I hand it over to Pascal and Jonathan. Thank you. We're going to share our screen. There you go. Uh, so uh, we're done with the introductions. So welcome to our presentation called Video Games, Participation, Empathy, and Pedagogy in uh, College Level Courses. So before beginning, we would like to thank uh, our partners for their support and help, Minister of Education and Higher Education, Centre de Documentation Collégiale, Association, College, uh, Private College Association of Quebec, ARC, IQPC, and uh, our institution, our home, Collège La Salle. So let's go to presentation mode. But yes, just to mention today, we will talk about our bursary, our uh, uh, subsidy that we won in 2021, which is $87,000. So th that was be, that's going to be one of the subjects of our presentation. It's a research and uh, experiment uh, program for pedagogy. So. Um, I think Nicole gave us a good introduction on what we've done um, with the, the tools we've used. Um, also, we just wanted to uh, connect you to a website if you want to see our research, uh, which uh, contains a lot of information. You can go uh, and click on these links, and uh, you can also scan uh, the QC code. The research project is in English and in French. So it's all there. Um, okay, so what are we going to look for here? So the what are we looking at here? So the content of our presentation today, we will talk about the context of video games. We're gonna talk about our research project, the objectives, our experiences and experiments, the results. And the last point, we're going to present a guide for teachers. So this is a guide that allows teachers who never used video games to give them some guidance uh, on how to implement that into their classroom. So we will begin by the context. So our research is about video games, but what uh, really motivated us to do scientific research on this subject? So, uh, the context, why, what brought us to, to do research, uh, scientific research on uh, video games? Um, well, we're going to look at the context. So the context is, first of all, we were very motivated because the success rates of our students in CEGEP are pretty low. So there's a pretty high rate of abandonment in uh, uh, 2018, only 63% of the CEGEP students finished uh, their diploma. So if you separate that out between uh, men and women, 56% for men, 
and 68% uh, for women that finish uh, their study that, at uh, Sejam. So it's pretty low. So it's uh, really worrisome. And the Minister of Higher Education, the minister at the time, she said that we have to increase the rate of completion of CEGEP uh, to 68% for this uh, year. So um, one of the motivations was to find a way to motivate the students, to get them more engaged, especially for me, my class is a general content one. So the motivation is a bit uh, less uh, there. It's a core class. So the other thing we were preoccupied by is the growing popularity of video games in Canada. So up to now, these uh, this is data from 2022, 23 million Canadians play video games. That's about 61% of the Canadian population. So you would be surprised that the average age of video game players is 34, and it's 50% men, 50% women. So it's pretty equal. Uh, for 6 to 17, we're talking about 89% of students who play video games. And for adults, 61%. So um, because we've been through a, a pandemic, and the, we were asked to stay home. So they did some surveys on the people's attitudes towards video games during the pandemic and during the shutdown. So, and they found that 57% of adults played more video games and 80% of teenagers, adolescents played more video games. And when they were asked, does playing a video game makes you, make you feel better emotionally, psychologically? 67% of the adults said yes. It helps them to communicate with people, to feel a sense of belonging, to play with others. And it was uh, quite necessary at the time. And 78% for adolescents, for teenagers. So all this to say, we have other statistics, other data, but around video games, but all this to say that the two main motivations uh, for us was really, first of all, how do we motivate our students? We would like uh, more motivation and engagement. And second, can we introduce video games in our classes? Because it's popular. These are things that the students like and they want to play. They want to use this. So can we integrate this into our classroom and uh, get them to learn some stuff. So um, will it work in a college setting and a CGF setting? So before starting our research, we did a literary review and we found that there was some existing research already. Uh, so here is what we found. So the highlights, what we've seen is in the research currently, we can see that there are uh, Correlations, generally positive correlations, but correlations between learning and using uh, video games for pedagogy. So there's learning that happens. We will look at that in more detail, but we also noticed that video games, uh, serious video games, create this sense of learning and uh, the students uh, really feel like they're learning something. They feel like they're engaged and immersed. When, but we have to... Uh, understand that video games don't replace the teacher. The teacher the teacher must always be there to guide the students in the video game. So somebody uh, wrote an article uh, very, very interesting about that. You have to keep that in mind. So these are points that are very interesting. As we notice as well, there's a lot of gaps. And the research didn't really look at the strategy part of it and how to uh, use specifically video games in the classroom. So we didn't have any much content about that. Uh, they were, most research uh, was about the results, the general results with the learning. And it was at the elementary school and high school level. So they just generalized uh, if the students are much better um, or are perceived to be better. So there's nothing really with the teacher with the uh, specific objective to teach specific things in the classroom. So if what we use a video game, is there a specific thing or uh, or is it just generalized uh, learning? So um, most of the video games are mostly concentrated on serious video games. So 
Jonathan will explain the difference. And we concentrated more on entertainment video games. So Pascal earlier talked about the different types of games. We have different categories. Uh, these categories uh, are not set in stone. Uh, so these are sometimes arbitrary differences. But if you look at the research, um, they know that they concentrate more on one type of game or one game specifically. And a lot of researchers said they would be funded research on other types of games that we call entertainment uh, type of games. So what's the difference? Uh, serious video games or educational uh, video games are uh, games created by researchers or scientists, and uh, they seek to uh, they seek to create a game around a specific objective. So they do um, something called Fold It is a very good example. It's a game where you have to fold uh, some uh, paper in a very creative and original way, and then researcher will look at that and try to recreate those to see if they can find medication, for example, or uh, word games that can increase the vocabulary of the user. So a lot of research around those forms, those type of games, serious uh, video games. What we tried to do is different because really there's a gap in the research is the entertainment style games. So these are really built by video game developers that are really, uh, they're professionals. That's what they do. So they offer a user experience based on entertainment, very immersive, very engaging. So an example would be Tomb Raider, Portal, Fortnite. These are immersive uh, games, uh, uh, very much attractive for the user because um, they really uh, have an experience. So we really focused on that. And we asked the question, can a teacher choose among entertainment video games, can they bring that to class and can they teach something uh, specific or have a specific objective in teaching with these tools in the classroom? So uh, that's uh, the uh, crux of our research. So the uh, bridge between serious games and entertainment style games, if you look at the Ubisoft, for example, uh, is uh, a large company and there's a franchise an office here in Montreal they are responsible for a game they uh, made a game called Assassin's Creed so if you're not familiar Assassin's Creed is a game uh, where you uh, explore a virtual world from uh, antiquity from the ancient Greek and Egypt uh, period of history and what they decided to do was to take this entertainment game and they had some missions in the game that were pretty violent and we're going to put together all these missions and we're just going to have a mode where you can explore where you can meet uh, people explore uh, uh, this world and learn about the culture the religion architecture art uh, from those historical periods so they uh, created what they call discovery tour and it's very uh, well put together very well researched very accurate so it's something that as uh, uh, convincing, that is uh, quite interesting. We didn't use that, but it's an example of a video game company, an entertainment video company that sees the potential of an entertainment game for educational purposes. So we're just going to show you a trailer, what it looks like, because we have teachers in high school who use it, not us, but in Quebec, teachers uh, in high school who use it. And I think uh, it could be a, a really interesting experience.
even if we're not a video game player, we don't have a lot of talent in playing video games, we could go discover things. Very intuitive, very instructive, and it's a lot of dimensions that are very interesting that we wouldn't see in other media. Educational games, it's an innovative tool. At a certain time, we were teaching with we were teaching with films, with cinema. We were doing it with theater, with books, uh, with uh, uh, literature. But th this is a new tool that the uh, teacher can use. So there's a lot of potential here in entertainment games uh, in education. So as we said, there's not a lot of research that examines the impact of entertainment style video games in the classroom. And that's our project. So what is our objective? Our objective uh, is to determine if entertainment video games could be a support material pedagogically and could lead to a significant learning experience. So we've implemented two video games, one in Humanities 101, which is equivalent to philosophy, and in the other class, which was interactions and cultural communities. So this, uh, was what we were working on, the first objective. The second objective was we wanted to create a guide for teachers to help them to implement video games in their classroom. So here are our two objectives. We also did two uh, uh, experiments. So that, well, we did this uh, on purpose because we wanted to Get away from the comment we always receive. Your in your class it works. Uh, video games work in your class, but it won't work in mine. So we wanted to have a multidisciplinary accent, accent, uh, aspect to our research. So for the first experiment it was in the humanities class. I know that among you you may have a lot of teachers that teach one uh, uh, subject in a francophone CGEP. So humanities uh, uh, it's the equivalent of philosophy. It's general uh, class, general information, the philosophy class. So we try to create the critical thinking in our students. The uh, uh, game I used was the game called Portal. I wanted with this uh, experiment measure if there's a difference between critical thinking before playing uh, this game versus after. And I defined uh, that with the Bloom taxonomy. So just to give you an idea in terms of implementation, of uh, the teaching material, what I've done is one day I brought my consoles, my laptops, I created four stations uh, with TV, uh, with screens, and then I put people into teams. People could bring their own laptop and uh, make their own playing uh, stations and they would play for two hours. Then what I've done is, and I help people who had difficulties because not everybody knows how to play video games, and then um, they bring the game, uh, they buy the, the game, and they start to play or continue playing at home for two weeks. And then I do the test again. So uh, that is the experiment. And for experiment two, it was in my class in ed specialized education. They played Never Alone, uh, Jamais Seul in French. So what we want to measure is the level of empathy of participants. So expressed in referring to Inuit culture. So we wanted to see uh, the uh, versus the ones who played it, the ones who didn't, uh, if the empathy would be more in the post-test uh, in this game that refers to Inuit culture. So 
we uh, based ourselves on uh, active listening. Uh, um, Carl uh, Rogers uh, is uh, uh, active listening. So uh, another uh, trailer here to show you. We will see that it's a bit complex. It's a first person 3D game. And the idea of it is to uh, solve puzzles in a 3D world. So um, there's also an intrigue and a story and uh, that's there. And I'm going to talk about that as well. So this is the trailer. For people who don't play video games, it may seem a bit complex, but uh, I'm going to explain the mechanics of the game, but more uh, the uh, guts of the game, the gears, the inner gears of the game. So the reason why I chose this game is because I wanted my students to understand why it's important to, to have critical thinking and uh, be able to uh, really digest all the information we receive in our lives. So a story called The Allegory of the Cave from Plato that really talks about uh, the difference between reality and perception and people's uh, ingrained beliefs. So um, they read the story, but they don't understand why it's important for them. So uh, I found this game that really brings them to uh, experience uh, something like being trapped uh, and having to escape uh, in, uh, from a cave, but here it's a lab. So it, it so um, they have beliefs that are not true, and they're told things that are lies, and they have to have a critical uh, thinking uh, of rea uh, reacting to that. So it's a 3D game, and it's about solving puzzles, but it's really the story that interests me. So what is this game? It's a woman who wakes up in a lab, and she is told by a voice that you heard in the beginning of the uh, trailer that all the... Uh, Everything is here to help you. We're just doing tests. And as you play the game, you understand that no, it's not uh, necessarily uh, safe and that the AI is not there to help you. So the object of the game is to really try to exit the lab, to get out, to find out if there's a real world outside. And the idea behind all of this was to test the students to see if a group that doesn't play video games and fills out the questionnaire to see 
if their answers are well it demonstrates uh, more or less critical thinking post the uh, pre and post uh, uh, playing the game so for Pascal he found a game called never alone so we're going to show you the trailer and I'll give you a bit more content So uh, the objective of the, of the game in my class, I wanted my students to understand the characteristics of the person coming from the Inuit community and to be more empathetic towards uh, that person, that community. So the story is Luna who goes on an adventure, Nuna, to find the source of the blizzard so she can save her community. Her community cannot hunt, cannot leave their house because of the blizzard. She goes on this quest. So the player plays uh, a seven-year-old girl. And through the game, the person who plays the video game, he has the opportunity to experience a story that comes from the Inupiaq community. It's a 2,500-year-old story. It's a story that is shared through Nuna, and it allows the players to understand the values, the traditions, the myths, and the survival skills from this culture. So also, the person playing this game is completely immersed in this culture. So it's really a wonderful experience, a wonderful opportunity to get to know this community and their culture and understand it and to be able to maybe gain some empathy towards them. And while they're playing both games, we created questionnaires uh, around these games and themes, and we wanted to make sure the students, especially people who know how to play video games, do not play too quickly. They like to finish the game as quickly as possible. It's like a race. So we want them to slow down, take their time, watch the details, ask questions. So we created questionnaires and discussion questions. And it's a very strong and important element of our research. So a lot of difference between uh, one type of learning or another with video games, depending on how fast you play and if you take time to explore. So for methodology and results, we're going to present that, but we have to present uh, the methodology of our research. So um, for the First experiment portal humanities. We had 35 students. We separated the group into two. So there's a pre-test. 
these are students who hadn't played video games, who did well, the questionnaire, the post test, we did the same questionnaire, but after having played the video game, I had two questionnaires the psychometric one and the discussion questions. So, um, what is the psychometric questionnaire? We're going to start with that. The psychometric questionnaire is a, a series of questions we took from our research around serious video games and educational video games. And what we found is video games, the serious educational ones, the, the kid effect learning must have a certain elements, certain dimensions. What are these dimensions? Well, it's a feeling that you're learning something, a feeling of being engaged, a feeling of being entertained and challenged and uh, developing skills. So they tried to measure how the players uh, felt when they played these games. And if there are any positive correlations there, well, that means that the game can contribute to learning. So there's a potential there. So for us, it's very important to demonstrate if the portal has the educational potential. The second questionnaire, the discussion questions, uh, this is a questionnaire, a series of questions to measure what they learn. So I wanted to see the critical uh, thinking if they developed that. So I uh, have seven different questions total, and each question was around one element of Bloom's taxonomy. So the first question was to measure remember, understand, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's in English, I'm an Anglophone, so, but I'm giving this presentation in French, so that's the idea. Uh, so uh, then we took the answers from both groups and we coded the answers and we looked at them and see if there's more uh, answers uh, uh, of one type or the other in each group. So that's the idea, that's the methodology. For the second experiment, the game called Never Alone, we had 20 students in the pretest and 20 and 16 in the post-test. So we used three types of questionnaires. The reactiv International Reactivity Index um, here. So what that does is we try to measure the degree of empathy. So is there more empathy once they've played the video game? So there are three parts that look at empathy. And these are questions. This is a questionnaire that is uh, very uh, well known and has a good reputation in psychology. And the second one is the uh, a life situation, a simulation. This is a, uh, Alicia who comes from the Inuit community. Okay, no, sorry. And that comes from the Inuit community. And she comes from the community. She arrived in Montreal. She just started high school. And there's the SET who does the first meeting with her. And I, I start. I ask students to create a scenario a dialogue. How can you create an alliance, a, a friendship with Alicia? So you can use any kind of. Uh, uh, social work techniques and we uh, and, and, and to do that. So we did the post-test and pre-test. So that uh, uh, gives us indications of empathy if they refer more to the Inuit community. And so as uh, Jonathan does, we also gave a psychometric test as well to the students in the post-test. So here are the three questionnaires. Um, there's IRI, psychometric, and life situations or simulations. So um, what did we do to analyze the data, treatment and analysis of data? I'm just going to give you an overview. So for uh, the uh, analysis of data, the questionnaires that were quantitative, we used a methodology, an external expert, and the software he used was RStudio. So I don't know if some of you want to do research. Uh, we uh, gave you a, a link and give you the information on these softwares that we use. So, and for the qualitative questionnaires, we 
did it ourselves. We coded the questionnaires and we used QDA minor six software. So what are the results? We're going to look at the results, experiment one. I'm not gonna go too much into detail, but uh, the first questionnaire was the psychometric one to show if our game has any dimensions that contribute to, to learning for the players. So it's very important and uh, it uh, helps us to see if our results are consistent with serious video games, educational video games. We saw some high and moderate correlations across many dimensions. And already this uh, uh, fits with the data with the serious games and indicates that the portal, yes, it has the potential to contribute to learning. So um, for the results, what kind of uh, learning? So do they have a critical thinking? Have they developed that? So these are the results, the pretest. We looked at their answers and we coded each word to see if it's on or off subject. And we saw, and I have them in order here, understand or memorize all the way to understand, analysis, analyze, create. So the post-test group, after having played the video games, they have more on-subject words than off-subject compared to the pretest. So you see that there's a difference. The more pronounced difference is in the apply section and in the evaluate section. So it means that the group who played the video game, they were capable of demonstrating critical thinking in their answers. So um, answers that were more on subject that demonstrate those skills. So it's really interesting. So the conclusions of all of that is that the psychometric test shows that yes, there's possible learning, um, but then there's a critical uh, thinking uh, that we see uh, in the uh, uh, more in the groups that played the groups that didn't play the video. I have a question. The number of participants in the experiment with Jonathan was it sufficient to analyze possible differences between answers from uh, women and men? Good question. And the same thing for the results Pascal will present. Very good question. So between men and women, no, we didn't have enough data. I noticed that there's a way we hired a methodology a researcher a re, uh, and uh, looked at that uh, and a research methodology specialist. We looked at that, but it's not uh, uh, reliable enough because the sample size is too small. But the results we give is really because our sample size was big enough to have some general results, but to be able to divide them between men and women, the sample size was too small. So yes, we can find data. Uh, where it would be statistically significant, but um, quickly, because we have more ground to cover, but um, it's really difficult to find participants because you have to follow ethical guidelines. So it took two uh, trimesters, two sessions with two different groups, three uh, groups of knowledge, and I uh, asked them nicely, with as much ethics as possible, would you like to participate in this research project? And I found 35 uh, uh, among the three groups. So, uh, so we, we tried to do that, but it was not possible. Thank you, good question. Okay, experiment number two, results from experiment two. When you look at uh, the empathy test, that uh, is very well known in psychology. If we look at the pre versus the post, we will see that there was a difference that is statistically significant of 4.5%. There's an increase of empathy. So that was very good. We don't see that a lot. We, uh, um, uh, statistically significant result like that in such a small sample. So that's something interesting there. Uh, then um, over here, when you look at the psychometric test and the post-test, we, we saw that there were high correlations, uh, many between learning, engagement, immersion, uh, 
uh, in the content, engagement, and immersion uh, uh, related to learning, very significant. And there was also a moderate correlation between skills, uh, learning, engagement, immersion, difficulty. So the perception of learning when they play these video games. Interesting. So when you look at the questionnaire around the, the simulation life situation, Alicia? Yes, okay. So when we do the comparison of the pre and post test between the values and the beliefs of the TES, what the students did, and when we look at their answers, when we look at values and beliefs, we can see that there was a difference. They would refer much more to the Inuit community in the post-test versus the pre-test. So that's interesting to see. So we could see that in the cat category one, the pre-test, they referred a lot to skills in uh, um, natural helper relationship, uh, reformulating active listening and uh, uh, help natural uh, assistance and helping techniques so if you look at the uh, that there's a difference so if you look at the category two uh, you can see that there's a much more preference uh, given to a new Inuit culture in the post test versus the pretest and there was less references to uh, the uh, social work uh, kind of outreach kind of techniques and we can see a market difference there when we coded uh, the uh, answers in these kind of uh, simulational. Uh... So what we could say is it demonstrates that never alone brings the participants to feel like they're learning. And yes, there are indications that there's an increase in empathy once the, they have played the game never alone. So we, we do one more thing and we'll look at the guide, but we did something important. I said in the beginning that we wanted a mental disability aspect in our research and we, the psychometric questionnaire that was the same between both experiments. So we asked our methodologist who is much more skilled uh, at the QM than us, part of methodology and statistics. So can we uh, compare those two groups to see if there are any interesting correlations? If you, will remember that the psychological questionnaire is really an education if the game, uh, entertainment games can have a potential to induce learning. So effectively, uh, yes, um, it's possible to do so. And we found very high correlations in all the different uh, categories and dimensions, except a few, but really it's a strong correlation. So it means, well, what does it mean? It means that uh, Portal and Never Alone, even if there are different games, different classroom settings, uh, the experience, the potential for education and pedagogy is there. Independently of the difference between our classes and the content, the game, uh, uh, entertainment type of games can induce uh, learning. And despite the differences, uh, Pascal used uh, 2D game we're going to talk about the difference between like a mario brothers game where you uh, run from left to right and i use the 3d so despite that despite those differences there are still comparable results an increase in empathy towards in you with culture for pascal and for me uh, critical uh, thinking uh, is uh, also increased significantly uh, statistically significant uh, in critical thinking so um, those are our results. Um, so uh, comments uh, for the game, Never Alone. This is what they said. This is a French uh, comment. The game is interesting. It's short documentaries. We can uh, uh, learn things with these short documentaries and we know what to look for and what to use. And what I liked in this game is that I completely was immersed in the game. In terms of values, we learn a lot. Uh, perseverance and uh, a courage of this little girl. I never imagined that uh, through video games, I would understand another culture, another val a set of values and learn uh, the history of uh, a people and a culture through a video game. So that's uh, very interesting. We 
had a few. We had to uh, really select. I think uh, this reflects the nature of the comments. So, what is what are the limitations of our research? So we have limitations, of course. It was an experiment. Uh, it's experimental research. So we wanted to survey, we get the lay of the land. What we wanted to do for another research project was to widen uh, our research to include more programs, especially in natural sciences, the hard sciences, technical programs like healthcare, pure and applied sciences, a lot of games we can use for that. And it would also be relevant to examine the risks. There are potential risks and potential for uh, uh, addiction issues, it's a bit like a casino could be. And there are maybe some values that we uh, don't want to share in the video games, uh, values that are not good for our students. So that uh, also is something we must examine. So what are the potential risks? And finally, the third one, would be to experiment with the largest number of games. We are uh, talking to some people. It's somebody at the uh, University of Singapore. It's a prof uh, who teaches business and economics, I guess, and uh, uh, accounting, I don't know. Anyway, uh, he uses a kind of simulation system where there's a budget, and all kinds of things like that to simulate real circumstances, a real company with economic circumstances and how you can build uh, uh, something. Um, so it's really interesting to measure the learning uh, that happens with these games. So there you go. That's uh, our research uh, project. It's a year and a half of work, but we did one more thing, it's a guide for teachers. This is our gift to the community. Uh, we really wanted to do something for the teachers, so we produced a guide, and I gave it to Nicole. Nicole Acupese, you have it. You have the guide in French and in English. And um, I imagine that you can distribute it to the participants, all those who want it. And we're going to talk about the guide, a bit about the recommendations, the pedagogical recommendations we can give you to show you and see if you're interested and uh, in how you could implement video games in your classroom. So in the guide, you'll have five main points. The first point is to concentrate on a specific uh, learning objective. The second one is to use online resources during uh, uh, our research for a video game that corresponds to our objective. Play the video game yourself and, uh, and uh, judge for yourself and experience uh, the game. Because if you don't know the game and you don't experience the game, uh, you can't really use it in class. You don't really understand it and understand if it fits with your uh, uh, teaching objective. Number four, evaluate the five dimensions upon which the game you choose can have an influence uh, So on the players. So uh, we, also created a questionnaire starting from uh, these points because it's important to uh, evaluate and uh, there are many possible issues when you look at a documentary and we look at the content and uh, uh, this is not going to be too long i'll use this documentary i'll show this part this part is important but for video games there's a lot of things to consider and uh, yes it's good for my class or not. So the time it takes, the content of the game, the context, the structure, and the mechanics of the game. And very important to elaborate observation questions and discussion questions and ask the students to answer these questions and generate discussions to, uh, around the video game. So that's a support. To, and we don't uh, send the students to play the game with no support, with nothing uh, to frame uh, their thinking. So and to frame uh, the discussion so that uh, there's a real learning that happens. So, uh, so very quickly for the fifth point, um, I was at ACFAS and there was a series of, of webinars, history teachers that used Assassin's Creed in their class in high school and even in university, but there, 
experience is that the teacher can uh, is not in the equation and he lets the students play and then ask questions and learn about uh, the culture, uh, ancient Greek culture, for example. And they found very clearly it doesn't work. It's not a substitute for a teacher. The teacher has to be there. You can't leave the students alone just to play the game and then ask them questions. So in our research, it, we already know the answer is clear. Video games cannot replace a teacher. So the teacher has to play a big role, has to be there with the students. And uh, we played an important role ourselves. Not only did we generate the questions and guide the discussion, but we're there in the class and we help the students, we guide them, we uh, are there right uh, there with them. So that's very important. Just a minor point. Okay. Um, yes, I have a question. So in your class, you introduced the video games from what I understand. Yes, yes, yes. We, when we did our experiment, it's been years, even before the experiment, what we do is we build place, we do playstations with, we have playstations with a TV, a console, a laptop, sometimes, and uh, some uh, joysticks. We have four or five uh, stations that the uh, students can use, and they can bring their own laptop as well for my class. It was a cell phone. They could bring their cell phone and put the game on their cell phone and play. And we had, and we, projected that on the walls with the projector and the groups that were together that would play the game and uh, looking on the, the wall, the big screen, and they were working together. Yes, it's great. It's, I find that it's important. If you want it to work, you need to do that. Um, it's, it depends on the game. Um, if it's on a tablet, um, and it becomes more complicated if it's a, a more robust game like Portal and I really have to plug in a lot of stuff, but I was capable of doing it. Uh, and my profession is not technician, but I can plug all the AV stuff in, but uh, it's possible. Thank you. So um, we're gonna start with the first one. The first thing is we talked about the five strategies. We're just gonna give you a bit more detail. In the guide, we talk about the first one. So really to have a clear objective, that's very important. So establishing a clear objective uh, as a teacher, you it's not just that you're using this material. If you use a movie, you have a clear objective why you're using this movie and you want them to learn something. And this is the same thing here for the video games. So for me, my objective was really to have them experience uh, being in the cave, the allegory of the cave. I want them to understand critical thinking. And Pascal, these were, uh, it was about beliefs and culture and understand Inuit culture. And it was very good to use this game because it gives them a lot of context and puts them in the situation and in that reality to improve uh, their empathy to be open to different communities and different cultures. So the resources uh, online, internet uh, resources, we have some suggestions. Yes, for the tools and strategies online, one of the strategies, we found a, internet, a website called commonsense.com uh, and you can uh, pick what's interesting for you, what type of game that you like. If, if you want it to be educational, if you want it to be mathematics, and, and it uh, will generate uh, the uh, game, it's called Common Sense Media, then you can choose from those games. And when you click on it, you can see that parents, at, uh, teachers and students who, who uh, have their comments there and rated the video game. And so there's a bit of text there and they explain the degree of Difficulty if the language is good or not good. Is there a lot of violence or not? Are, is there alcohol, drinking, drugs? And those are important things to know. And I, I think when you want to use that in the classroom and uh, present that to our students. And I think if you open an account, it's free for teachers. It was. I don't know if it's changed or not, but and it, for films as well. So it can be useful for films for parents also. 
So also when you look at uh, purchasing, there's a lot of platforms that uh, you can use. The most common one is Steam. So Steam, what you can do is you can click on categories and you can do a search there and click on what's relevant for you. Or you can have keywords in a search engine and it will generate a whole series of video games. What's interesting is there's a, a, a there's a bit of a, there's a clip there. There's a trailer for each of the game. There's also uh, some ratings and comments and give you a summary and overview of what the game is. So another resource um, that I recommend is a way to search games. You still have to be interested in the video game world and the interest industry a bit. You have to know a little bit about the industry, about games, and you can go look at different websites. So I have some examples here. Uh, but there are some in French uh, as well. Most of them are in English. And uh, so I'm going to give you a list of resources there. And uh, uh, Game Informer, Coco2, Destructoid, and these are uh, often have articles, not just uh, critiques of games um, and reviews uh, on those websites. There Sometimes they have uh, articles that talk about the theme of a game or a game that's interesting for uh, different reasons like the uh, for, uh, how it portrays women in video games, for example, the relationship between the genders, for example, in video games, and so on, et cetera. So if I read these articles and mention games that are very interesting that I didn't know about, so then I can go and explore, and that's where I get ideas. I'll give you an example. Like here, there was an article on Kotaku, tell me why it's free uh, during Pride Month. So uh, tell me why uh, I don't know that game. It's a dialogue game, a discussion game, you're uh, a woman who's exploring, who doesn't have a real identity yet, and she's discovering. And so it talks about uh, the themes around this game. And then I went and I looked at the game, I looked at uh, the reviews, and I saw that, yes, it could be interesting for a class uh, that examines the uh, uh, general sexuality studies or psychology, etc. So it's really, that's where I look for ideas. So we recommend that you go see these websites and then you have to play the game yourself. So take the time to play. That's your homework. Your homework is to play, but play the game uh, always and uh, keeping an uh, um, the focus on your students. What will be their perspective? What do they see? What will they notice? What will they feel? And how does that fit in with my teaching objectives, my learning objectives? Is it obvious what they will take away from it? If it's not obvious, you have to have questions that generate discussions that will uncover the uh, hidden themes. So you really have to have uh, a methodological uh, a methodology, a real uh, um, process, how to fit all that in your in your class. So we do this for films as well. Sometimes I teach literature and when I choose the books I want to use, I read them and I think about how I can bring out themes and subjects and so it's the same kind of thing. And so now we're going to talk about the factors to choose a game. So the different factors, the five factors to choose a video game. So we created a questionnaire, but just to explain what these factors are. So the time to takes to play the game, if your video game is very long, takes a long time to complete, it would be important to talk to the students and to tell them not to spend more than an hour at a time to play this video game and to take breaks because we saw in literature that if students play a lot of hours, there's a risk of addiction. Also, to avoid uh, reward systems that are random, we have to be very careful because that can create uh, addiction um, as well, variable rewards. So that's uh, those are the things we have to consider. So when we talk about the content of the video game, we're talking about the story. So the 
story. What is the content of the story? Some video games, the objective is to make it to an island and kill, killing a lot of people. So there's not a lot of content and story there. But if you look at the game Never Alone, for example, then that becomes very interesting because the content and the story is very relevant and it's very good uh, for my class for many reasons. It's all about values and beliefs. So each video game has a story. You have to look and see if the story and the themes fit with your objectives, your class. So another one here is the context of the game. So it's not the content, it's the way they will play the game. So if it's a game with a one player and a first player kind of game, it's very different than a game with two players. A two player game would be, um, how would I say this, more cooperative, a more of a co-op kind of game. Whereas the first person game would be uh, not so cooperative. So when we talk about the context of the game, and the rules. What are the rules of the game? Uh, what does the game allow you to do or what does it not allow you to do? I have to think that also my game is a one player game. As a teacher, I could also create rules. I could say, okay, even if it's a one player, we're gonna play two, three people together and one or two will look at the other person, will make comments, will make suggestions, will uh, contribute to uh, ideas. And uh, if the other person cannot uh, uh, pass a certain challenge, the other person can take the joystick. So it's a collaborative experience, even if it's a one-player game. So that's really interesting. For the game Never Alone, it was very interesting to make them play collaboratively because the players, the students, they discover how they can develop uh, cooperation and empathy in the Never Alone game, those were very important values um, and with the Fox and with Nuna. So in the video game, it became very real for them, this experience of collaboration and how important it is to help each other and work together. That's very interesting. And uh, in playing the game, they experimented the cultural values of uh, cooperation and uh, so the structure of the game, what kind of game? So earlier I talked about 2D and 3D games, so I'm not gonna get into too much detail there, but the uh, 2D games are like Mario Brothers type, never alone, left, right. It's on a two, it's on a flat plane and it's easier than 3D games. So in 3D games, there's a learning process. You have to situate yourself in 3D. So that's why it's important to play video games in your classes and at home, take some time because the students will have some difficulty, will have to get used to it and really learn uh, how to do the movements and, and control the joystick and do certain things on the screen. So, uh, however, uh, the 3D games are a bit more immersive and the engagement process is faster, whereas the 2D games are less immersive and the engagement takes more time in general. So, there's advantage and disadvantages to both. And um, the last factor is the mechanical part. How will they play the game? Do they need a joystick? Uh, is it a touch screen? Are they using a mouse and a keyboard? Uh, I have a Nintendo joystick. I don't know if uh, people are old enough to remember Nintendo from the 80s, but uh, you probably recognize the joystick. Uh, so. Uh, how we will play the game is important. So we created, starting from these five factors, we created a questionnaire for the teachers to see, to evaluate if the video game they have chosen is good or not. So we uh, have all the factors here in this questionnaire. It's in the guide as well. So as a teacher, you can use this table as a platform, as a tool to evaluate those different dimensions. We have an English version and a French version as well. And we talked about the observation and discussion questions, really important to take the time to think about relevant discussion questions and make sure the students take time to notice details as they play the video game. 
So, um, and so we're at the end here. We have four minutes for discussion and questions. There are no questions. We uh, already had a few, and it's very clear and interesting. But I want to specify Stefan Kutsu, the coordinator of uh, EA Sport, Electrical and Sport at Tedford Sejep. He mentioned to go see the esports people in the colleges because they are excellent resources to help you uh, throughout the me on the different video games. So it can be a very interesting resource. And with the criteria you talk about to evaluate the relevance of video games, it could be really interesting to, uh, and, and having the guide, I think that the people who participated in this can uh, say that they received all the information concerning uh, using video games pedagogically. Stefan asks the following question. In the different uh, games, 3D games, have you experimented and tried uh, and had physical problems like uh, um, being nauseous or loss of orientation in the 3D games and the virtual reality? Pascal, no, it wasn't a problem, but it's a 2D game. But yes, uh, I had, it's been eight years now that I work on this project each semester, 16 of them. So it doesn't happen often, but it does happen where there's one person, one time that she was so dizzy and disoriented. And uh, I think she even uh, threw up. So uh, what I recommend is, first of all, I chose a game that's pretty old from 2007. And when they, play in my class, I reduce the quality of the graphics. There's a way of reducing the quality of the graphics so that it, the game goes a lot faster and it's not as jumpy and much more fluid. The problem with the feeling of vertigo that we're talking about is because the pictures go really, it lags. Uh, so 20, 30 images per second, it's too low. So it, uh, creates discomfort. But if you can increase that, the number of frames per second, you won't feel that anymore. So the trick is really to drop the graphic quality. If it's a more modern game, then I advise to uh, bring your own laptop or a console because it uh, it could happen. If you don't have the right equipment, it could be negative. Yes. There are no other questions, which means you have one more minute for lunch. A big uh, thank you for your presentation. I've heard it before. I've heard it in English last year, and it's very interesting. And uh, I uh, hope you will get good feedback and good success. And uh, bravo for the work you've done. It uh, was uh, really good and very interesting. Bravo to both of you. And uh, we will see you uh, soon. Pascal, I thought people.